this is from an interface standpoint, this is an amazing, amazing setup because I think we have multiple cameras. We have this touch screen. We're on a Google Hangout. The NSA is listening. Everything is, <laughs> is happening together. Uh, so thank you very much for having me. Um, my, since you probably don't know me from Adam, I'm just a regular computer dude in San Francisco. I run a small artisanal bookmarking website. Uh, by artisanal, I mean I run the whole thing myself. I have my own servers. I make my CPUs out of a piece of silicon and a sharp knife. And I, uh, I have about 20,000 customers that I charge 10 bucks a year, and I make my living that way. And then I go and give these talks, which have very little to do with my day job. But I am in uh, the Silicon Valley orbit, and so I kind of um, I, have, I have issues. I have concerns. And these talks are a way of, uh, of performing a kind of therapy. So this, the, the talk I brought to Australia is called Who Will Command the Robot Armies? It's actually just a skin on top of this much more uh, mundane talk called Accountability in Automated Systems. But they would never buy me a plane ticket and put me up for a week to give a talk like that. So we're going to talk about who will command the robot armies. And uh, in the minutes to come, I want to present a few candidates to possible answers to this question. Uh, I want, to, I want us to think about robots widely, though, as like all of these things in our lives that are now kind of on automatic pilot are algorithmically run, sometimes our devices, sometimes our devices that move and have claws and attack us. But in all cases, uh, these new participants in our, in our life, in our social life with machines. So obviously, you can't talk about robot armies without starting with the army itself. I always thought how fun it would be to be behind these guys in a metal detector at an airport. Uh, <laughs> um, so the, the, this will be the grimmest part of the talk, and then I promise it'll kind of lift up, uh, so it just kind of hang with me. Uh, we're going to start with you know, dark topics where we actually have robot armies now. We've had them for 20 years or so, and we're heading towards a world where we have kind of fully autonomous weapons. Um, the, maybe the birth of these was in around 2001, where there were these unmanned aerial drones like the one you see in the photo, and somebody got frustrated looking at Osama bin Laden through the camera and realized that you could actually hang a couple of missiles under this thing and make it capable of uh, killing people. So this has grown into a cottage industry of unmanned devices, uh, including ones that are kind of field portable. You throw them like a paper airplane, and they zoom around the battlefield and see you know, what the situation is without endangering people. There's also a kind of bigger one that you can now fire out of a tube, and it has a small amount of explosives in the front so it can rove around and you can pick your target whether it's a, a truck or an orphanage or a group of soldiers and it'll perform this kind of kamikaze attack uh, based on on what you see so these uh, and these vehicles exist in land form as well you have these little mini tanks i don't know if you ever when you were a kid if you ever got these remote control cars that were on a long wire so they weren't really very cool but this is the same idea where you have ordinance that roves around and you have control over it remotely so that you don't have to expose yourself. It can also save your buddy in the field. This is a robot heroically saving a human being, dragging them away. Uh, and the Russians, of course, top us always. The Russians have this thing, which it, uh, it's, an, <laughs> it's like an automated guard dog. It patrols around, and I think if it encounters you, it asks you in a thick Slavic accent, you know, comrade, what is your business here? And if you can't answer it, It'll fire all its little weapons into you. Uh, so there's, a, there's an arms race of these vehicles. And they're, they're not all as mean as this one. Like There's this bit of nightmare fuel, which is like an automated mule. Uh, another picture of it, a headless horse. So this is, um, I think, part of a DARPA project to like, basically carry people's luggage around on the battlefield so they don't have to have the little rolly bags with them. And again, not exposing people to danger needlessly. Uh, and apart from these terrifying mule-like creatures. There's also just basically automated trucks and a whole thriving defense industry that is trying hard to build vehicles that uh, help soldiers not put themselves at risk. Right? So here I want to use a little, um, little analogy to the US space shuttle. Because the thousand or million dollar question with autonomous weapons is, is there ever going to be a point where one of these robots is going to be allowed to kill people without human intervention, or it can just automatically go off and you know, do a Terminator-style mission? Uh, 
The space shuttle, I'm kind of fascinated by for many reasons, but one interesting thing about it is that it was a fully automatic spacecraft except for one feature. When you came to land it, and this was about 10 seconds before touchdown, the landing gear would pop out, there was a button that a human being had to press. The astronauts at NASA were concerned that if the space shuttle were completely automated, it might not be sent up as a manned mission. So they insisted that this design have a single point where a human being had to, had to be in the cockpit. And when the Russians built their completely not stolen version of the space shuttle called the Buran, they eliminated this feature. It was a completely automated spacecraft. And so the first and only time that it flew, it flew without a crew for safety reasons and testing. And I think with these autonomous weapons, we're going to see something very similar, where they were, their capability has already evolved very far. It will evolve further until there's a single point of control in the system, single bored 18-year-old American soldier sitting in a trailer in Las Vegas who presses the button, and then eventually something will happen or some other country will build a system where that person is no longer in the, in the loop. So it's kind of a slippery slope. I had a much more detailed argument for how this could happen and be persuasive about it, but the election kind of makes it moot. Now everybody's like, oh, well, of course, of course they're not going to care. And we're in this weird, weird moment in the United States. This is a, a memo from Barack Obama where he has extended the state of emergency that we've apparently been in for 15 years into a 16th year. We've had this moment of panic in America, and it hasn't really stopped. And it's driven a dynamic that I think is, uh, is scary and problematic for, for our future. Because this is the war part of the talk, I'm going to, instead of showing pictures of war, I'm going to show pictures of uh, kids that I met in Yemen when I visited three years ago. So these are wonderful kids, and they're the part of the population that's most affected by the dynamic that's going on. So what's happening is we have technologies that are making soldiers in Western armies more difficult to kill, more difficult to capture, which is a good thing, unalloyed. Uh, planes are harder to shoot down. If you shoot down a UAV, nobody gets hurt or caught. But what that means is uh, people who are fighting against armies of occupation turn to softer targets. They turn to civilians, and so you see these horrible massacres being perpetrated in places where we're fighting our wars, partly because we've become mostly invulnerable. And every once in a great while, one of these enemies that we have succeeds in, in conducting an attack against the West. And then we, of course, react with panic, fear, and a kind of desire for revenge. And the dynamic drives itself further. There's also the problem that even though I don't think anybody individually in the Army, whether the American one or the Australian one that fights with it, wants to have a permanent state of war, there is a benefit to having a permanent state of war which is that you get to, to practice these techniques. You get to see who's good, who's bad in leadership, and you get to try out new technologies of surveillance and new technologies of automation with a very low moral bar to clear. And as this continues, we kind of see the, uh, these technologies start to come back to our regular lives here in the first world in, in unexpected ways. But I want to point out how weird it is, too, that this has been happening and will continue to happen. I was thinking, you know, what if Indonesia, which is a giant neighbor you have, uh, was flying unmanned drones over northern Australia to see if anybody was talking shit about the Muslims, for example. I think half of Queensland would be on fire, and then the whole Australian Navy would be en route to Jakarta, you know, to fight it out. So the idea that we have the right and the obligation to patrol these distant lands and use our robots there is an odd one, uh, unless you're used to it. So the Army is kind of my first candidate for who commands the robot armies for obvious reasons. But there's another contender that's just as good, and that is the police. Uh, like I said, the police has this weird relationship where in America, certainly, and I think also here in Australia, you've seen lots of surplus come back from our, our years and years of warfare. There is a militarization of police forces that is, is surprising and unprecedented. And you see military vehicles popping up in, in cities, in small towns even in, in America. A couple of years ago when the Boston bombings happened, we were shocked, of course, by the bombings. But we were also stunned to see that the police had turned out in full battle kit, looking like Terminators. They'd stuffed themselves into body armor, and they had tanks and armored personnel carriers. Uh, and you know these were just hanging on the shelf ready to use. My favorite anecdote from this terrible episode is that they shut down all of downtown Boston, but they demanded that the donut shops remain open so that they could use them as a mobile command center. Uh, <laughs> 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 
And these kind of technologies also, you know, what we also get is behaviors and attitudes come back from these distant wars and how we, we relate to our own fellow citizens, to the civilian population. You see a militarization of attitudes and a hardening of attitudes that's troublesome. So these, of course, are like the most obvious signs, but there's other technologies that come back and are, are more subtle. There's a lot of drone stuff and UAV stuff happening, and in particular, like aerial surveillance has made enormous leaps. There are these megapixel cameras that can loiter over a city for days at a time, and if you've ever seen movies where there's an enhance button and they keep zooming in and zooming in, we've actually built that because the resolution is so great that you can sit at a console and you can track people uh, the latest models that, that, that I've seen publicly, like you have 60 different entities, cars or pedestrians, you can just track in an automated way and then zoom in whenever you want to. So there's kind of some sci-fi stuff uh, that's happening with, with aerial surveillance. Of course, the American Border Patrol and Australia as well is using these unmanned vehicles to, to, um, you know, to, to look for dangerous refugees who are trying to come in and, and open a decent restaurant so we can intercept them. Uh, on their way into the country. In America, at least, it's a boondoggle. I don't know if it's working out better for Australia. You have much more territory to cover. And you also have these unmanned marine vehicles that I can't get a picture of, but there's ships that are also moving around. And then there's devices like this one, the Stingray, which is a fake cell phone tower. So you deploy this and cell phones connect to it and you can intercept phone calls. The American law enforcement has been using these very heavily and very secretively. They've they tried for a long time to deny they even had them. And this, again, is a technology that was developed for use in a wartime context that has come back to, um, to us in a civilian context. And then most recently of all, we had some shootings in Dallas where the perpetrator ended up being killed by a, a, a robot with a bomb attached to it. This was a bomb defusing robot that had been, I guess, talked talked into going in the other direction down at the precinct house and they strapped a bomb to it and sent it in to look for the guy and kill him without endangering police officers. Which was the first, I think, robot killing of, uh, of a suspect in, in American police annals. And again, it's just a, a clear case of technology transfer back to us. So we tend to think of entities like the CIA and the NSA as the bad guys when we're worried about government surveillance. But for all their faults, like these government intelligence agencies in Western countries have a lot of internal controls and structure. There are people in there who are lawyers who are committed to certain ideals. There's, there's procedures. There's points of control. And what I'm worried about is not so much the NSA or the CIA, though of course I'm worried about those, but it's you know, uh, Sergeant Roscoe P. Buford of East Dillweed, Arizona with access to these really high-tech surveillance systems and technologies. And we have uh, we're promiscuously kind of sharing them among local, local and state police departments and as well as access to national databases of like facial detection, uh, you know, modern uh, DNA sort of stuff. So in, in San Diego, for example, police are just photographing people every time they interact with them so they can create a, a database of facial recognition features. They're swabbing their cheeks for DNA. And there's very little control over it because it's the San Diego Police Department. They're supposed to be suntanning and telling people not to jaywalk, but they've kind of gotten drunk on these technologies. So I promised you the first part of the talk was grim, it would get better. Uh, let's talk about other robots. Let's talk about robots that like us, Robots that want to be our friends, that want to live in our homes and help us with our day-to-day -day lives and aren't just out there killing us or, or watching us from the skies. One of my favorites of these, the Juice Bro. Anybody heard of this thing? Ah, oh, you guys are in for a treat. It is the $700 internet connected juice smasher that lives on your counter. That little packet you see is, a, is one of fresh veggies that cost only seven American dollars per cup of juice. It has a QR code on the back. If it's not internet connected, it will not squeeze the juice. It will not take that risk. It will not take the risk that it's not completely fresh. So it'll scan it, it'll check it live, and it'll squeeze that juice for you if it passes muster. Only $700, but you must act now. There is the Flat Ev Tortilla Maker. It's like the Keurig cup of tortillas. Has this little tray that deposits a tiny tortilla, only one American dollar per, uh, per dough container. Also, of course, connects to your smartphone. Has anybody heard of the Vessel? V-E-S-S-Y-L. Man, you guys, you're missing out on the future. The Vessel is the smart cup that tells you what you're drinking. It's been <laughs> under development on Kickstarter for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, you see this one tells you you have a beer. 
you could probably just hard code that for the Australian market, but in America we need we need options. They've actually done it. They can't get this to work, so they've done it. They've hard coded it for water. This is the vessel Prime, Prime with a Y, of course, that will tell you exactly how much water you're drinking uh, to make sure you're hydrated. There's kind of a, a deep and profound connection between hydration and the Internet of Things that I don't understand, but there's at least like ten internet connected water bottles out there. Uh, but who wants to drink water? We want to drink things that are more fun. So here's the cuvee, the $200 smart bottle that uh, it has a touch screen so you can read about what your wine tastes like as you're drinking it. You can order more. If you forget to charge the cuvee, the joke's on you because it will not pour wine if it doesn't have a charge. Uh, you just have to sit there and wait. The Wilson Smart Football it rotates, it moves, it has gyroscopes in it, it tells you, gives you feedback. There's an app that graphs exactly how bad of a football player you are. Um, so one of my favorite things is called the Molecule. It is the completely portable air purifier. You can just pat around your house in your bare feet carrying the 40 kilogram Molecule by its convenient leather strap and it will purify the hell out of any air that it finds so you never have to breathe a speck of dust or a, a chemical again. The Smart Kettle. One of my favorite appliances. Say goodbye to dumb kettles. There's a wonderful, um, wonderful little tweet episode with a guy named Mark Rittman, who he's a data scientist in England, and he tried to get his eye kettle connected to the various other smart appliances in his house. And he tweeted the saga, which was kind of great. So it took him 11 hours total. Um, at the three-hour point, he tweeted, three hours later and still no tea. Mandatory recalibration caused Wi-Fi base station reset. Now port scanning network to find where kettle is now. So he had to, it had a DHCP thing and it was hiding on the, on the local network. And then there was this very postmodern moment that came because, of course, people started following this saga on Twitter. Um, and he, he, he tweeted that now the Hadoop cluster in the garage, like we all have, is going nuts due to retweets from Internet of Shit, saturating the network and blocking MQTT integration with Amazon Echo. So by complaining about this, he DDoSed himself and, and, and cost himself another few hours of misery until finally he had this triumphant moment where he got the kettle to work, and he said, the kettle is back online and responding to voice control, but now we're eating dinner in the dark while the lights download a firmware update. <laughs> so that is, uh, that is life with the Internet of Things. Here is Peggy, the smart clothespin. Peggy has a light sensor, a humidity sensor, a temperature sensor. I don't know if you're supposed to have 20 of these or if you have one and you just dry things sequentially. I really, I'm not sure how the, the modern world of drying is supposed to work, but it will notify you when the garment is dry. I forgot what this thing is called, but it's a smart mirror and a smart scale. So start your morning right. Climb on the smart scale. The smart mirror will look at your skin and tell you if there's any blemishes that have appeared overnight. And that's kind of like you're welcome to the day. Uh, you're getting fatter and you have acne. Here is an Indiegogo floss dispenser. It kind of it sits on your mirror and it will flash at you if you haven't flossed in a while. And it will spit out a piece of floss for you to use. My favorite thing is the UI for this if you have two people. Like say, you know, your spouse. So when you're done, you take it off the mirror, you flip a switch to the other person, and then I'm presuming you kind of back away slowly so you don't trigger the motion sensor and it lies in wait for your, uh, for your partner. Um, here is a stone that you clip to your belt that will remind you to breathe. If you're not breathing correctly, it will send you a text notification on your phone saying you need to calm down. I imagine if they ever find me dead, there'll be a big red screen on my phone saying, you know, you really have to start breathing again. If you're tired of a world where you have to wait 12 minutes for a batch of cookies, this is uh, internet connected, I think it's called Chip. It will bake you cookies in under 10 minutes. So you have three extra minutes at least to enjoy your cookies before you know, sad sack next door gets to eat them. The internet connected tampon. This is a beautiful invention. <laughs> um, so this clips to your belt. So. And it will notify you when the tampon is, is, is full and has to be changed. There's nothing that gives you peace of mind and security more than having something that's inside your body be connected to the outside of your clothing. Uh, similarly, there's Huggies Tweet Pee, which is exactly what you're most afraid that it is. Uh, it is a sensor that clips onto a diaper and it will notify you via social media when it detects that the diaper is wet. They tried to make one of these that detected when the diaper was full of shit, but it proved impossible to distinguish from regular Twitter content. So tweet P it is. And then Keisha, the umbrella that tells you when it's raining. Uh, extremely useful because you don't know because it's above your head. You know, you have to listen or you check your app. 
It's also very, um, one, one feature I like in the kitchen, and I met someone who legitimately likes this thing because it's very clingy. If you leave it in a restaurant, it starts harassing you by SMS. You know, like, hey, you know, I'm at the restaurant. You want to come back and get me? What are you doing? Where are you? I miss you. And that brings me to, like, how, how are these devices all really supposed to interact with us? Right now, the model is that every one of these wants an app of its own, and it wants to send you notifications with no concept or idea of what any other app is doing. They remind me of, like, little chicks that are just constantly clamoring for attention, and, you know, the maximum amount possible. These designers haven't really thought about how everything is supposed to work together as a system. So another answer to who will command these robot armies of friendly robots in our homes and who is going to tie them together into a cohesive system that works is, of course, Internet hackers. Internet hackers will solve the problem of the Internet of Things by breaking into all of them and, and making them into a botnet. Um, how many of you code here for a living? Raise your hands, please. All right. Raise your hand if you've ever had binary numbers projected onto you during during the work experience. Me neither. Do I see one? Oh, uh, you're a lucky man. Yeah. I've, I've been a, a, a developer for like over a decade and I've never had binary numbers either streaming behind me, projected onto me, on my screen. It's not a useful display. But every single one of these like hacker, uh, hacker info, um, what are these things? So stock photos has this. And you see the ergonomics of this hacker are terrible. The hoodie should be parallel with the screen. No, he shouldn't be hunched over. You want your back straight. This person is even worse because they don't have, they don't even have a standing desk. They're kind of holding it like a, like a waiter as, as they hack into a system. So a couple of weeks ago, we had this happen. Uh, I guess today this map could mean anything, uh, many bad things. But two weeks ago, all this map meant was the, the, the footprint of a denial of service attack that was due to these cheap webcams and other devices that had hard-coded passwords being hacked into. And someone attacked the domain name servers, and for uh, the better part of, I think, two days, the, or a better part of a day, a lot of big-name websites were offline. And this sparked a big panic because there's no easy way to update this stuff, and, and, and there's no way to recall it, and nobody is liable for it. Nobody even knows where it is out there. And the software that can perform these denial of service attacks is now open source, so anybody can use it. There was a, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the, the name of the paper now, but it's, it's been recently in the news. Um, there's a smart light protocol where smart lights talk to one another. I don't really know what smart lights have to say to each other. They're like, you on? Yeah, I'm on. Are you on? You, like, you want to blink? But, um, but apparently they talk to each other, and researchers figured out how to hack them from 70 meters away from a car or fly a drone just past the windows. And not just hack them, but they can brick them. They can make them non-functional. They can make them unable to install firmware updates. They can make them uh, turn on their Wi-Fi signal at full blast so it would effectively jam Wi-Fi wherever the lights were installed. And this attack is infectious, so if there's lights across an entire city block, they will all infect one another. Um, you know, this is... a this is kind of an endemic problem to the Internet of Things. All these devices are terribly poorly secured, and there's no sense of whose job it is to secure them. So, of course, the idea is that you're going to have a kind of butler. You guys recognize this? This is Google Home, which was just announced recently. Sorry, I'm going to demonstrate how robots can't handle water. Here we go. Um, so Google Home looks like George Orwell's air freshener. It just sits on your desk, it listens to you, it has speakers in the base, and it's supposed to serve as this kind of butler to coordinate all of these Internet of Things devices. And, of course, Google, to its credit, can secure these things really well. They have the engineering and the know-how, so instead of having everything and its brother connected to the Internet, you have one point in your home that's Internet connected and serves as a gateway to everything else, and you can have your security happen there. Google, therefore, becomes my next candidate to who will command the robot armies. But Google is an interesting beast. You know, it, right now, they've, they've just introduced a, a phone called the Signal. So you have a situation where you have Google building hardware with a Google operating system that runs on top of it and a Google browser that runs on top of that, talks to a Google DNS network. You check your Google run email on it. You visit websites by searching for them in Google. And the websites all have Google Analytics on them or double-click tracking. So Google has this kind of complete view of your online life, and now they want to have internet-connected microphones in, uh, in every room of your house. And on the same day that Google announced Google Home, we discovered that Yahoo had been checking all email, all 80 of its active email accounts, for 
the U.S. government, either by request or because a secret court order made them do it. And the particularly terrifying thing about the situation was that it was done without the knowledge of Yahoo's security team. Yahoo's security team is second to none. Google's security team is second to none, but that doesn't matter if you're completely bypassing them. The Yahoo security people found out long after the fact. They thought that Yahoo had in fact been hacked. They panicked, but it turned out that, that this software had been installed without their knowledge or consent. So this is the real problem. We, we're building the Internet of Things. We're putting always on microphones in our houses, and who gets to control these robot armies? One problem of the last, I'd say, 12 years, you know, even since like Bush's second administration, is that presidential power in the United States has been increasing. The, the powers of domestic surveillance have gone up, partly because they've been granted in, in, in a, a situation where people are afraid. We've granted more and more surveillance powers to the president, partly because they've been expanded by redefinition. You know, secret, law, secret laws that we don't know about that are, um, that are interpreted very broadly, but mostly because of the same technological change that we've seen in our world, where things are getting vastly better, faster. Big data techniques allow for breakthroughs in image recognition, speech recognition, all of this stuff. Uh, the government is just using it like we are. They're getting it from the civilian side. And unfortunately, Obama has been very selective in how he uses these great powers of his so that there hasn't been a big backlash against the degree to which surveillance exists in our lives. Most of that surveillance is in the private sector, but these are all American companies that are one secret letter away from having to cooperate fully with, with a brand new government that is run by a monster, you know, who we've just elected. So this is the situation that we all face right now. So, all right, Google is out because they're too scary. What about Amazon? Amazon already has this friendly cylinder. Anybody have one of these, the Amazon Echo? Do you like it? Do you have kids? All right, everybody I've talked to that has kids loves this thing. You can set a timer, like there's all, you know, your hands are covered in barf, there's a child on each one, and you can, you know, change music. So I find it very interesting that um, Amazon seems to have hit, like, a really useful useful spot with this device. And it has a, they've, now they've released these little hockey pucks so you can also spread them through the rest of your home. Amazon, we have a more straightforward relationship with them. They just want to sell us as much shit as possible. And that's kind of, it's kind of laudable and, you know, I, I, I can get behind that. Google is very weird and indirect. They want to build, they want us to become immortal, but they also show us ads so they can fund that. It's squirrely, but Amazon just buy shit. I can get behind it. And as Amazon knows about robots. It runs the cloud, you know, the biggest, possibly the biggest, one of the biggest automated systems in the world. And it also has big dreams, right, of uh, drone delivery. This thing fascinates me because people who haven't seen a drone or really haven't heard one don't realize how annoying it is. The sound of these is just impossibly annoying. The bigger they are, the worse it is. And it's a physical problem because the propellers spin, you know, they have a heavy load. And the heavier the load, the, the, the more noise they're going to make. So the idea that we're going to live in a world with these things just buzzing past us like snowmobiles uh, is an interesting one. And Amazon has this kind of bizarre, broken idea of how the world works. Like they release these little Wi-Fi buttons that you can press on to order a product. Like, what is this scenario exactly? This is from their website. I didn't make it up to be funny. Like, what in what situation is this useful? Like. <laughs> You had some bad curry and you, and you had all weekend in front of you and you're just going to wait it out? Like, <laughs> even if the drone brings it to you, it's going to be a while. So I, I'm fascinated by just the mental model that Amazon must have. But we have a, you know, we have a Trump problem with Amazon too. Jeff Bezos just the other day, quote, after the election, congratulations to real Donald Trump. I, for one, give him my most open mind and wish him great success in his service to the country. We see our tech industry is folding without even any pressure being applied. Obama's still in office and we're already kind of kowtowing to our new uh, authoritarian ruler. And this is the guy who runs the cloud, so that's a pretty big deal, and owns the Washington Post, which is one of the most influential newspapers in American politics. But I want to talk about a different aspect of Amazon, uh, which is kind of their other robot armies, uh, the people that work for them. Uh, has anybody read Carl Chapek's R.U.R., the play that introduced the word robot? I didn't either. I felt I should because I'm giving a robot talk. And uh, so he coined the word in the 20s. What really like, surprised me in the play 
was that the robots weren't mechanical. The robots were biological creatures. Um, even though their you know, stomachs and muscles and bones were made in factories, they were assembled and they were identical to human beings, except that they didn't feel pain. They didn't feel boredom. They weren't afraid of death. They were, you know, all they wanted to do was work and be productive. And this is kind of who Amazon hires and employs behind the scenes now. Uh, not just Amazon, but they're a good example because they have such an enormous workforce. What's interesting to me is that in the United States and wherever else they can get away with it, Amazon doesn't hire these people directly for the most part. There's a year-round staff and then there's seasonal people. The company they work for is called Integrity. And in an American corporate context, Integrity, calling your company Integrity means that it's probably the, you know, the lowest, sneakiest thing there is, is around. The, the nicer the word, the more suspicious you should be of what the company does. Um, Clear Channel was another good example of that, which is the, the radio uh, ad monopoly. So Amazon has this ideal of, of a human worker who is never seen, who is never ill, never has to take time off, doesn't have, has total schedule flexibility, and they're not responsible for. Um, there's a lot of startups, in fact, that follow this model where what they're actually selling you is repackaged labor, low-wage labor, but they're dressing it up to look like a high-tech startup. We have this thing called Blue Apron in the United States. Does Blue Apron exist in Australia? Have they? So do you have other types of meal kits that you subscribe to? There's like 101 of these startups. The concept is all the same. I call it a sous chef simulator, where you basically have these prepped ingredients and you get to do, if you have a short attention span, you make a meal in 20 minutes out of the stuff. And uh, Blue Apron is, is ferociously expanding and it has a lot of labor problems in, in the Bay Area now because they just they don't know how to run a factory and they don't know how to run it safely. People are getting, uh, uh, police are getting called out regularly. People are getting beaten up there. But the attraction is that you have very cheap labor that is just repackaged beautifully for you that you don't have to think about. We're kind of used to this in the context of globalization. The laptop I'm presenting from obviously is made in China by people who, you know, who work low wage jobs. My hope is that they're people whose lives are improving because they came from out in the village somewhere. And you know, they're sending money home to their families. But that's part of the deal with the devil we make in a globalized society is that we know that a lot of the, the clothes we wear, the stuff we use is made uh, by low-wage laborers. But it is made by, by people far away from us. And here we have people who are, are uh, you know, our fellow citizens, but who are kind of behind this computer interface. I think of this like, whole concept as the scriptable people, where you have someone on one side of an API or a computer screen that has a lot of power over somebody else who isn't treated as fully human. And it's weird because we're so into artisanal stuff. We can sit all day and listen to how our pork is grown or how our bread is baked by someone and their life story and you know, how, they, how they like to caress the dough and things like that. But we don't really want to hear about the artisanal nature of the person who packs the Amazon box kind of how fulfilled they are and how much they love their job. We just want to pretend that they don't exist and automate them away as if possible. Uh, <clears throat> and you see this as well with, uh, with companies like Uber and everybody else that participates in the so-called gig economy, where they're kind of repackaging something that sounds appealing to us in the professional class. Complete independence, schedule independence, choose your own hours, do the work when you want, but they're trying to pretend that it works the same when you're on survival wages. And of course it doesn't. There you want some sort of stability, you want some sort of uh, dignity that you, is totally taken away from you. I think then the apotheosis of this is Amazon's very own mechanical Turk. Whoever named this was kind of a, a, a genius. Like mechanical Turk was originally this device here, which was, it was supposed to be a chess playing automaton. And you see there's a little seat that a person snuck into and you know, clandestinely controlled uh, the arm so that it could, it could win chess games against human opponents. So for one, there's like the colonial aspect of calling something mechanical Turk when you're Amazon, regardless of the historical reference. But then there's also this idea of fitting a human uncomfortably into the shape of a machine, which is exactly what it does. Mechanical Turk is a way for people to farm out labor that requires human intervention, but pay for only, you know, pay for it minutes at a time. So if you have a survey that you want someone to fill out, you can send it out to 300 mechanical Turks and they will complete it for you and send it back. The social sciences of all things have gotten very dependent on, on this service, which in turn creates a weird feedback dynamic because a lot of social science research is about things like low wage, wa low, low wage work and the impact of, um, you know, certain priming tasks and how they affect your behavior 
But when you have someone who's filling out these surveys for eight hours a day nonstop as fast as they can, the results you get might not be the, the high quality data you think they are. Not to mention the paradox of exploiting people while you're studying whether you're exploiting them. So Mechanical Turk is like the ultimate expression of this scriptable people idea that I find abhorrent in ways that I'm still trying to learn to articulate. But here's my favorite device that uses Amazon Turk. It's called, um, it's called Ethical Turks. And this is a, a kind of an art project slash Internet of Things device by Simone Rebadango. It's a fan that makes ethical decisions. So bless you. So let's say Dushan and I are sitting together at a table in front of this fan and we're both starting to sweat. The fan will detect this and it knows that it's a robot so it can't make ethical decisions. It will send it out to Mechanical Turk for kind of like a referee. You know, all right, which one? I can only cool one of these two guys. Which one will it be? And then it'll provide the image and the data and then it'll get an answer back from the human being somewhere which will then be displayed on the screen. So for example, you know, Maciej's fatter, so he's less comfortable, so you know, blow on him. Or you know, Dushan hasn't had a, a, the fan on him in a while. So, so it's kind of articulated for you by a human being. This is a very responsible robot behavior. The fan knows that it's out of its depth. It goes to a person. And I like that it exploits the one thing about people that makes them still distinct from robots in this mechanical Turk context. And you see this machine has two dials. The first one is for religion. So you can choose what belief system you want this ethical decision outsourced to, whether it's a Hindu, a Muslim, a Christian, or an atheist. And then there's an educational level dial as well. So you can, you know, should someone with a college education make this decision or someone who's only been to high school? And, um, and the fan will respond accordingly. If You should see some of Simone's other work. It's, it's very, like, it, he has beautiful ideas about how the Internet of Things really, uh, what it really means philosophically. And I like that it's expressed in the form of working devices. So finally, I want to talk about um, you know, the robots within us all. And I know that you guys right now have never felt more engaged and alive, and you're kind of fully in the moment with me. And I, you know, I'm at the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs as well. But most of our lives, when we're not in this talk right now, we go through on kind of semi-autopilot. And a lot of modern advertising and, and, and uh, Algorithmic stuff is about manipulating our reflexes and reactions when we're not really fully engaged, when we're kind of behaving like robots. I think this is fascinating and new and, and interesting. So, of course, we all know brand awareness and, and these kind of hyper-targeted ad campaigns that we see online. That's nothing new, even though the fact that it's precisely targeted at us is something different. But there's different kinds of stuff. Like Kathy Carlton, who's a marketing executive, wrote a wonderful blog post. She flies U.S. Airways a lot of the time. And... Uh, with U.S. Airways, you get these boarding zones. So sometimes you're the first on the aircraft, sometimes you're the very last. She noticed that after a while, she was consistently in the last boarding group, so she had to even change the bags that she carried with her because there was simply no room for them. And after a few months of flying like an animal in the fourth boarding group, she finally realized that they were trying to get her to get the credit card. The U.S. Airways credit card is one of its perks, puts you in the second boarding group and not the last one. And so some algorithm somewhere decided that it was just going to, tighten the screws on her and make her life miserable in this very small way over a very long period of time until she finally caved. Uh, I, like this kind of long game in advertising and manipulation I think is fascinating. It's right below the threshold of what we even notice but it happens from all directions over and over again and the, kind of the cumulative load of it is, is heavy. So the um, the expression of it that I like a lot is, is chatbots. Chatbots are this new fad. And what's wonderful about them is their complete insincerity. You're interacting with something that's pretending to be human and is speaking in the first person from a brand perspective. So you know it's bullshit. The chatbot knows it's bullshit. And what's best is sometimes you're not even connected to a bot. It's a human being who's you know, behind it because it's been, it's been kicked up to them. So I was riffing on Twitter a while ago about computer hell and what that would be like. So what kind of machines would be there? You'd have your iOmega zip drive that went click, 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 and you would have the Apple hockey puck mouse, if you remember the, the most horrible of the mice. And at one point I said the Comcast, the computer hell is proudly served by Comcast, which is our version of Telstra, kind of this very hated internet company, uh, internet provider. Uh, the Comcast bot, of course, noticed this, and Comcast Cares immediately tweeted to me, good afternoon, I'd be happy to look into any connection problems you're having from computer hell. So 
we got proof that, uh, that I was right. The computer hell was served by Comcast. Uh, and a similar, very similar situation happened when I was whining about Google a few days later. When Google Home was introduced, I said, it's sobering to think that the ad-funded company running your phone, DNS, browser, search engine, and email might not cherish your privacy. And I followed it up by saying, Google Home looks pretty great, though. And Google immediately responded saying, thanks, I'm glad you love it. Uh, and then either some poor flunky later or some algorithm that's much smarter than I gave it credit for eventually discovered the irony and deleted the response. So I can't present it here with you. But I like this idea that we're being monitored and pounced upon by brands with these cheery robot identities. Douglas Adams had those friendly doors that nobody could stand to walk through in his, in his imagined spaceships because they always wanted to chat with you. This is a, a similar implementation. Um, I want to give a shout out to my ex-cat, Holly. Uh, she was a great animal. I, I lived with a really smart fellow for a year or so, and he called me in one time. He was at his computer, and he said, hey, I, I taught your cat to fetch. And sure enough, I saw her running up with one of her toys in her mouth, and he, you know, she dropped it at his feet, and he threw it, and she brought it back a couple of times, then got bored and went off to sleep somewhere like cats will. And he explained to me, Holly's been doing this a couple of times a day, um, and you know, I've completely trained her to, uh, to fetch stuff that I throw. And then we put our IQs together and thought for a moment and realized that he hadn't trained her anything. She had trained him to be a cat toy. <laughs> She learned that anytime she's bored, she can just run over it. He, he would stop the most complicated programming task to throw this thing mechanically for a, for a cat. I was really impressed by this example of manipulation, and I think about it every time I interact with Facebook. This is a, this is a really weird screenshot from, uh, it's a live video feed from Facebook of, of some battle in Syria, and people, these are emotions that people are, you know, clicking, like, that they're angry, kind of streams by, and they can react. So. Facebook tells us that we train it. Facebook says that you know, it learns from what we like, what we dislike, what we share, and it gradually shows us only content that interests us. But what's really happening is just like with my cat, that Facebook is training us to be as engaged as possible. It throws material at us that it knows that we'll react to, and it gets better and better iteratively. So like, right, one of the tragedies of, of the American election right now is that we saw the triumph of Facebook as uh, just a, an engagement maximizer. There were entire groups of people who were creating disinformation and fake news articles on Facebook that were being served out to people across the country. Now, something like roughly half of Americans get their news from social media and Facebook, and of that half, another half, that's their sole source of news. So this has an important uh, influence on people's decision making. Mark Zuckerberg has reacted to this in a, in a schizophrenic way. He's basically said that Facebook has no effect on people's uh, beliefs and voting behavior. It does have an effect when it reminds you to go vote because that's a good thing. So he says that Facebook did help by flashing reminders that you should go to the polls. And of course, it does influence people when it comes to showing advertising and uh, stuff that is paid to influence people, but not these shared stories. They're not, they're not responsible at all. So in a lot of these situations, where are the robots? And how to not be manipulated is a big question in, in how would we run our society. We would all like to be always in the moment, always kind of conscious of our biases and reactions, but that just can't be the case. My final candidates for who commands the robot armies are Chad and Brad. I don't know who these guys are. Chad and Brad is my mental shorthand for, for programmers that can't be bothered. Uh, they've had a busy week. They just got to crush the code and get it out there. So for example, uh, Chad and Brad designed Pokemon Go. When it first came out, Pokemon Go demanded every permission on the planet. It could, you know, it could read your email, see all your contacts, buy and sell your house, uh, disinherit your children. It had every permission possible. And the first thing that it did was ask for a photograph of the inside of where you lived. Um, that's a pretty alarming thing. And it turned out that this wasn't a CIA plot to get photos of every house in, on the planet. It was just Chad and Brad who couldn't be bothered to get it right, and it was fixed in a patch. This is another uh, example from Facebook. In America, it's illegal to advertise housing or employment with any sort of a racial uh, criterion. You can't say, I just want Hispanics to live in my, in, you know, in my garden apartment. It is so illegal, I can't even describe how illegal it is. And Facebook just kind of did it by accident because Chad and Brad implemented it. So there's a pull down here where you can you configure your ad to have an ethnic affinity with African Americans or Asian Americans or Hispanics. Uh, I don't know how this got into production of Facebook. My theory is that every Facebook lawyer who saw it had a heart attack 
and just dropped dead from shock. And so because it didn't get vetoed, it got pushed out into production. And they've now shut this down. But this is just an example of how uh, like noxious and damaging decisions can get made without any responsibility. Uber is another good one. Here's a, on the right-hand side is a racial map of the demographics of Los Angeles. You see the yellow and orange are black and Latino communities. And the free ride zone in Los Angeles conveniently ignores most of them. They do the same exact thing in Chicago where um, there's a zone that's considered downtown Chicago that is only half the city because the other half of the city south of this highway it doesn't fit the demographics that Uber wants. My guess is that Chad and Brad just looked at zip codes and did a cutoff at a certain income level. But of course, by doing so, they reinforced two centuries or more of uh, racial discrimination. And a great example is just the other day after the election, Facebook popped this up at me saying, give me your address and I'll tell you who got elected in your district. San Francisco has tons and tons of elected representatives, but here's a site that knows everything about me, who my friends are, what I like to do, where I've been, where I travel. The only thing it doesn't know is where I live. And the moment after Trump got elected, it wants, to, it wants me to give my exact physical location to them so they can display that, in, that, um, that back. It's a remarkable like, lack of imagination. So let me recap. Who will command the robot armies? Maybe the actual armies will command the robot armies. Maybe it'll be the police. Maybe it'll be deadly hackers. Uh, I guess not Russian anymore because we're friends with them now. Will, the next bad country. Perhaps it'll be Google. Perhaps it'll be Amazon or Facebook. Uh, perhaps it'll be some tired ass programmer who just can't be bothered and wants to go home. Maybe it will be all these brands that just want to interact with us. And in giving this, preparing this talk a few weeks ago, I wanted to end on like a really upbeat note and say that who will command the robot armies ultimately is all of us together as a society, you know, holding hands with our Coke in hand, with our song on our lips. But I don't think it's true. I think that what we've discovered is that the people who are going to control these technologies are those who want it the most. And I'm not persuaded that we want it as speaking now as techies. We just don't want it. We want the control without the accountability, without the responsibility. We want to have employees, but not pretend that they're not really employees, that we don't owe them a living and livelihood, that they're independent contractors. We want to push things forward algorithmically, but say that we don't have editorial control, we're just tech companies. We want to build all of these automated systems, but we don't really feel responsible for how they change society around us. And the only solutions that I'm really hearing are, we're just going to build more. We're going to automate further. We're going to invent self-driving cars. We're going to have rockets to Mars. We're going to rebuild cities de novo from scratch. Um, I would kind of like that. This is a, if you're a Futurama fan, someone did this beautiful rendering of what Futurama might look like. I'd, I'd be into living in that. But the problem is that, you know, we, um, we're not going to get a new set of technologies that solve all our problems and don't bring additional new problems that are even worse. That's not how technology works. So what we have to do is take these tools that we have and buckle down and, and learn how to use them responsibly. Um, to conclude quickly, I, I, on my way here, I stopped in two places because I'm a wuss about jet lag. I stopped in Dubai and Singapore. I didn't really think about the significance of it, but as I was walking around, I realized they both represent this kind of future that we could go towards. Dubai is, is the apotheosis of the gig economy, where people work with no protections. It's a society based 80% on expats who come and do contract labor and go home and have no path towards citizenship. And in many cases, uh, have no protections at all legally, de facto. You can't go to court and sue an Emirati and win a case. Uh, the best you can hope for is to be sent home to Bangladesh or the Philippines. And Dubai is upfront about this. This is the social contract. They're building a city in the desert that didn't exist 20 years ago, and this is how they have decided to go about it. Singapore is a different case. Um, it's like the world's tastiest police state. Uh, I, I don't know how to feel about it. It's another city that's, that's come up from nothing in the last 50 years. The trade-off there is that you have surveillance, you have um, kind of a nanny state that looks into every aspect of your existence, but in return you have prosperity, you have racial harmony, and you have kind of a guarantee that uh, you're all in this together. Um, here's a user experience thing I like in Singapore. When you pass the border, they give you this card, but you only get it once you're in Singapore. So if you happen to have, I don't know, a kilo of heroin that you're smuggling internally, you're in for a rough couple of days while uh, 
um, while you wait to see if they catch you. But to be fair, people who live in Singapore don't feel like they're oppressed uh, you know, all the time. Uh, and I don't really know how I feel about it either. But as, uh, as Walter Subchak would say, whatever you feel about these two cities, Dubai, Singapore, at least it's an ethos. You know, at least they have an idea of what they want. The leaders of these places built them with a goal in mind and they've moved towards it. We haven't. We haven't planned a thing. We've just built these technologies on the basis that if it's cool, if it earns money, if it satisfies a technical itch, or if it's possible, we're going to do it and it'll all work out fine. What we've done in the end is build a panopticon society where we have an amazing set of tools for looking deep into what everybody is doing, um, following them around, tracking them, and to no clear purpose. We don't really get a lot out of this. We have advertising-based stuff that's very inefficient. And now we have uh, uh, an orange monster in the United States who has taken the reins of power and has access to everything that he could possibly want from these technologies for four years and probably for eight. So we got to pity the poor robots. You know, they're, uh, they kind of depend on us. We've built all this stuff, and I think it's incumbent on us to treat it better and to run it with some sense of purpose. And I think it's especially necessary that these people that we've surrounded with surveillance tools, without their consent, we need to now take steps to protect. This isn't just true for me in the United States, but because the internet is centralized and those companies are mostly American companies, it's true for all of us together. And that's gonna be the big challenge uh, you know, for, for the foreseeable future. And this kind of sums up how I feel. Uh, I did wanna say, I said this at Direction, I wanna say it here. Australia is a nice place to receive terrible news. It's been a really bad week for a lot of American expats and you guys have been phenomenal in uh, treating us nicely. So I wanna thank, you know, Society to society, thank you for that. And I want to encourage Dushan to invite me back next year so I can talk about who will command the robot navies. Um, I don't know if we have any time or if you have any interest, but I'll take questions either individually or as a group if, uh, if you want me to. Thank you. Um, yeah, we have time for questions. So, yeah. um, Please feel free to leave as well if you're just... Okay. I'm not, I don't know you, I, you can't hurt my feelings. <laughs> yes, any questions? Well then, I see how it is. All right, yeah, well thanks again so much for having me. Um, yeah, yeah, what would you like, young man? So the question is about standardizing the Internet of Things and if there's a work group that does it or if there are plans to do it. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I think there's a panic mode. People have realized. And the interesting thing is that all this stuff with the Internet of Things happened before the election that changed a lot of people's attitudes towards having automation in the home because, you know, a, a new atmosphere has, has arrived. So the last thing before the political context changed was people trying to come up with ways to not get regulated and not, uh, you know, proactively make, make, make this work. I think a big problem here is just there's no liability law. If I make a terrible device that gets hacked and does a lot of damage, there's no way to sue me for it. You know, these companies have just kind of said, oops, they're Chinese companies, they're, they're, they're building this stuff in a hurry. So I think there were some discussions coming about, about putting standards together, but ultimately it would have to be like a underwriter's laboratory seal or something. Like when you buy an electrical device, you have these, or um, some of them are government mandated, some of them are voluntary, but you know, they have these like, uh, guarantees that it meets some criteria. And so I think there was talk of that, but it, things have changed so much in the past week, I don't really know where this is going to head. Anybody else? All right, a quiet, docile group. I love it. Thanks. <laughs>